Well, it's been a beautiful morning already to hear this testimony and the baptism. It's a wonderful blessing for us to see how God is living and active in the lives of people. So we welcome, welcome you here. Uh, back in 1985, there was a fire that happened in the stands as people were watching a soccer game in England, and 56 people died as a result of that fire. So there was uh, people that were looking at the video footage of the game, and they were able to kind of see what was happening. Why did this actually occur? Why was there so many lives that uh, were taken as a result? Because the fire alarm did go off. And so as they were watching the video footage of what happened, is that they noticed that even though people heard the alarm, in fact, they could even see the fire that was taking place, they, they remained in their seats continuing to watch the game until it actually ended. And so it took time for them to actually get out of their seat and start to go to safety. And the other thing that they noticed is that they didn't always trust the emergency exits. Even though they said they saw the sign, uh, the, the, the immediate response that we often have is to go out the same door that we came in to that particular room. And people don't trust uh, going into a different place. And so there was a psychiatrist, David, uh, sorry, Dr. Stephen Gomez, made a conclusion about this. He says, after 25 years of being a psychoanalyst, I can't say that this surprises me. He says, we resist change. Committing ourselves to a small change, even one that is unmistakably in our best interest, is often more frightening than ignoring a dangerous situation. We don't want an exit if we don't know exactly where it is going to take us, even or perhaps especially in an emergency. We want to know what new story we're stepping into before we exit the old one. Now, we probably don't need a psychiatrist to tell us that we resist change. I think we, we know this intuitively. We, we know that we resist change, especially uh, when you think about last Monday was apparently the most depressing day of the year. Did you hear about that? Blue Monday. I think some travel company came up with the idea because they figured you want to travel on that day, uh, partially because of, you know, Christmas uh, debt that you've accumulated, uh, the dark days and cold days of winter, and the fact that you've started New Year's resolutions and realized that you can't actually complete them. And so this idea of how we resist change comes crashing in on you in this very depressing moment that we can't actually change. And so here's the question that we ask in a whole variety of different ways. Is it possible for real change to happen in our lives? Yes. Can real change happen? And Susan agrees that it can. She's always pulling the punchline before I can get a chance to say it. <laughs> And we say it all kinds of different ways. Like, can an overweight person become thin again? Can the alcoholic ever become sober? Can the extravagant spender actually have a positive back bank balance? Can the chronically depressed ever become happy? And we can ask all kinds of questions like that. But the bottom line is, can we actually experience real heart change? Well, the Bible says, absolutely we can. In fact, that's the very heart of the gospel, is saying that we can change, that we can experience something profound difference with inside of us. And that the gospel says that it is never too late for us to change. We are not defined by our past. We are not imprisoned by our track record, but that we can actually experience something profound inside. So our series that we've been looking at is called Clear Thinking, and the key verse is Romans 12, verse 2, which says, Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. There's lots of words there talking about change. Let God transform you. That's the Greek word metamorpho, which means, uh, where we get the English word metamorphosis, it literally means being transformed after being with, after being with God. You, God transforms you. And then there's another key word in there, another interesting Greek word there about changing the way you think. It's referring to a change of heart. It's literally what it means, change of heart. 
that there is a renewal, that there is regeneration, that there's something completely new happening in the depths of your heart. And God wants to bring metamorphosis into our life. He wants to change us completely. And part of the way he does that is by changing the way we think. The deep change that happens within our own heart. And that's why New Year's resolutions don't work. Because what we do is so often is we try to change our behavior without actually changing the way we think. And we're going to be deeply disappointed if we don't actually address the deep issues of what is actually occurring, how we actually think, how we actually process things in the depths of our heart. So we've looked at clear thinking as a re- in terms of problems, having clear thinking about our relationships, and today, uh, in a way, I'm going to be stepping back and looking at the bigger picture, and that is how can we actually think clearly about having a change of heart? Is it possible for us to actually have fundamentally changes happening deep within us? So there's a, a scripture text, a story in the New Testament that talks about a gentleman who had a deep change of heart, And I want to look at that, and this is how Luke records it. Luke chapter 19, the first 10 verses. Jesus entered into Jericho. By the way, he's on his way to Jerusalem, where a week later he's going to be crucified. And he makes his way through this town, and there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name Zacchaeus. He said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and looked, took Jesus into his house with great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He had gone to be a guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. And Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost. Now, this is a fascinating story. It really is an amazing story, especially in light of what just happened a few verses earlier. In chapter 18, uh, the crowd and Jesus encountered this rich young ruler was trying to gain access into the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus uh, said, well, sell all your money and give, give it away. And, and the man was too wrapped up in his possessions, and that was too hard for him. And Jesus responds, and he says this, how hard it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom of, heaven, uh, kingdom of God. In fact, it is far easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. And so with this fresh on the minds of the crowd, they now find themselves encountering another very wealthy person. And maybe they were wondering, what is Jesus now going to say to this person? Because surely it is going to be impossible for this person to have a change of heart. Zacchaeus was a very wealthy man. Because he was a tax collector. Now, tax collection in those days was really legalized extortion. They went around and and grabbed as much money as they could from the citizens, and uh, they would give a portion to the Roman government, and they would keep the rest for themselves. And so tax collectors were absolutely hated because they were both thieves and traitors. They took way too much money than they needed, and they were actually abetting or, or helping the Roman government, which was their oppressors. And so the tax collectors were not looked upon favorably at all. Not only that, but he was the chief tax collector. This is the only time that this occurs in the Bible. And so it's referring to somebody who is, we've, we've heard of tax collectors like Matthew, who was a tax collector, but Zacchaeus was the kind of guy that would actually employ people like Matthew. So Zacchaeus was high up in the food chain, very, very wealthy, and also very, very hated. And so this man's chances of his heart being changed are slim to none. The whole camel through the Ivan Eagle thing. 
So whenever I picture Zacchaeus, I often think of Danny DeVito. <laughs> Danny DeVito, if you know the character, uh, the actor, he's uh, vertically challenged. And he often played parts that were a little bit slimy, a little bit, you know, uh, he, was, he was the guy that was kind of, his eyes were darting to see if there were any enemies nearby, just in case he got stuck in the ribs with a knife. Or, and Zacchaeus was kind of like this guy, and he was going from tree to tree behind and trying to get through the crowds, and the crowds weren't letting him in because, well, they hated him. In their own way, they're going to allow this jerk to get through, and so they, they block his way. And so the only thing that he could do is actually scamper up a tree and get onto a limb so he could actually get a peek at Jesus. And did he find Jesus? Absolutely he did. In fact, the encounter with Jesus was so profound that there was this radical change, the deep heart change in Zacchaeus' life. So my question is, how did that happen? How did this occur? What were the things that happened to allow Zacchaeus to come from this hated chief tax collector to actually having a complete heart change? And how can we learn from this? And so I want to pause here for a while and ponder and reflect on this story to learn how we ourselves can have a heart change. And the first point is this, that I must be open to the initiative of God. Before we can expect for our heart to be changed, we have to be open to the reality that God has actually been seeking you before you've been seeking Him. This is the actual beauty of God's grace. That before you actually start thinking about God, he's already been thinking about you. Now the day that Zacchaeus met Jesus may have been just like any other day. Zacchaeus kind of rolls out of his satin sheets. And he puts on his robe over his silk pajamas. He walks across the marble floor. He steps up a couple of rungs and a step ladder so he can look at the highly polished mirror in his bathroom. And as he's looking into the mirror, maybe, just maybe, Zacchaeus didn't like what he saw that morning. I mean, all the the years of stealing and thievery, all the years of being a social outcast, maybe has started to take a toll on how he thought about himself. And maybe he even uttered the name Zacchaeus out loud as he was looking at himself in the mirror. Zacchaeus. And then he scoffs, because Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus is a really good Jewish name. It's a wonderful name. It means righteous one. But for a tax collector to be called the righteous one is much like calling the town prostitute chastity. The name doesn't, meet the char- doesn't match the character. I don't know if Zacchaeus had this self-revelation, this crisis identity. I don't know if he went through any of this or not. But there is something that triggered Zacchaeus that I have to go and see Jesus. He Somehow he found out that Jesus was coming into town. In verse 3 it says that he tried to get a look at Jesus. And he went to great lengths in order to be able to do that. And and Luke tells us, he says that he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree. I love the fact that Luke Luke is quite specific. He's very detailed in the way he writes his his, uh, history and, and the account. First of all, that he ran. Right there, that in itself tells us something because Jewish men in those days didn't run. It was undignified. That's why, you know, the, the story of the prodigal son, the father running to his, his son, was so significant. Uh, Jewish men just didn't run. In fact, Zacchaeus was extremely wealthy, probably the most wealthiest man in Jericho. You don't run when you're wealthy. You pay other people to run. When you're wealthy, you just mosey around. And yet, Zacchaeus went and took the risk and ran and he scampered up a tree like a kid. And it took some courage and took a risk to do that. And maybe, maybe it even took courage for you to come here this morning. That's a possibility. And so I applaud you in having that courage to do so. But here's the interesting thing about this story. That as Zacchaeus was literally out on a limb trying to get a peek at Jesus, Jesus sees him. 
Now, a sycamore fig tree actually has these broad limbs and, and thick leaves. And, and maybe Zacchaeus was, I don't know, maybe he was even trying to hide. Maybe just peek through the leaves, just to have a peek. You know, something like when you're trying to see something through the keyhole of a door and you don't expect anybody to see you, but actually Jesus saw him. And then we have this in verse 5, a remarkable verse. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. How did he even know his name? Zacchaeus. He said, quick, come down, I must. He doesn't say, I would like to. He says, I must be a guest at your home today. And so when, when Zacchaeus decided to take a peek at Jesus, Jesus was actually taking a look at him. And this is the way it is with God, that when you decide that something needs to change, something needs to occur in your life, you want to change something in your life, that, that God already knows your name. And you find out that he actually already knows what you need. You find out that he already has his eye on you, that he already loves you, that he welcomes you, and he wants you to take him home. And he wants to start the great work of metamorphosis, of transformation, of Recreation of regeneration that's deep within your own heart. Some of you may have given up on God. You may figure, well, he doesn't care about me. He doesn't pay attention to my situation. And therefore, you know, maybe you're just here out of habit or maybe you're here because somebody forced you to come or whatever it may be. But you need to know loud and clear that God knows your name. He knows you. He knows what you need. He loves you. God's been around your tree for a long time. In fact, I, I kind of visualize God shaking the branches a little bit. Hey, by the way, I'm here. I want you to know it. I can see you. Come, invite me to your home. I must go with you. I actually think that's when the heart change happened, right there in that moment. I think that's when Zacchaeus' heart made a shift. When Jesus called him by name and said, I want to go home with you. Uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating that uh, when you think about this short man in a tall tree, and you think about the fact that he is hated by everyone, all of a sudden, he finds himself at the center of God's attention, that he is God's agenda at that very moment. What do you think that does to a person? When he is confronted by this absolute, unconditional love, this mercy and this grace, absolutely changes a person. When you look at verse 6, our English translations say that, that he climbed down. All our English translations say that, yeah, he just climbed down quickly. But there's actually no Greek word for climb. It just says that he came down quickly. And so some people actually think that he fell out of the tree in astonishment. Pure astonishment. Like he can't believe that Jesus paid attention to him in that way and expressed that kind of love and welcomed him in such a degree. And so he fell out of the tree. And in those days, when you had a meal with somebody, it was a profound, beautiful thing. It was an intimate, relational experience. And this is, way, this is Jesus' way of saying, Zacchaeus, I want to be your friend. I want to know you. I want you to know me. Let's go for lunch. Let's have this experience. And this was... God's way of saying to a person who felt way on a limb, I want to be friends with you. And this is how heart change happens for us. That God moves near to us in Jesus Christ. And his arms are open wide. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. That God welcomes you and he wants to have you bring him home. He wants you to bring him into your life. He wants you to bring him into your relationships, into your family, into your home, into your workplace, into your classroom. He wants you to bring him into your life. So do you, do you feel that tugging from God? Do you ever sense that? Do you feel like God is actually in, 
invite, inviting you into that. Yes. And this is what, what God, this is what happens when we are in relationship, when we're open to hearing from God. So Zacchaeus was absolutely surprised that Jesus would make him the agenda for that day. He was surprised that Jesus would invite him into this level of love. And it may surprise you too. In fact, a lot of people have been surprised by this love. And that brings me to the second point. And that is this. I must believe that God loves sinful people. Now, this may seem like a no-brainer for, for many of you. Those of you who have experienced God's grace and God's love, you've experienced transformation in your life, this may seem like uh, a no-brainer. But do you realize that there are many, many people that do not believe this or know this? Either they've never heard this before, or they have heard it and they just simply don't believe it. And so when you look closely at this passage, there actually is a dark part, a dark side to this story. Primarily the story is about a man whose heart was radically changed by God, reconciled to him, his sins were washed away, he was brought into this relationship in the kingdom of God, and that's the beauty of this story. But there's also something else going on that shows that not everyone accepted this kind of love. And it was a crowd of people that were growing angry with Jesus and felt that he was nilly-willy throwing away this love in an inappropriate way. This is what it says in verse 7. It says this, But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. They grumbled. And the Greek word says that all of them did this. All of them were upset. And so this situation became real ugly real quick. Because when Jesus walked towards Zacchaeus, the crowd might have started to think, okay, now Zacchaeus is going to get what he really deserves. Let's, let's Jesus make sure you throw a few woe unto you kind of things to say to him. And maybe uh, hellfire and brimstone and turn and burn and all those kind of things that you can throw at Zacchaeus because he desperately needs some real lashing. He really, stick it to him, Jesus, because he needs it. And maybe they were licking their lips in anticipation of what Jesus might say, that he might give him what he really deserves. But Jesus didn't come to give us what we deserve. If we did, if he did, we wouldn't be here. He didn't give us what we deserve. He gave us what we didn't deserve. He gave us his love and his grace. And he said, friend... I want to have lunch with you. I want to stay at your house. And the crowd couldn't believe it. In fact, the crowd was livid. They were so angry. They had already condemned Zacchaeus, and now they're criticizing Jesus for giving him this kind of love, for hanging out with him. You know, some people believe that God only came to make good people better. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, in this section of Scripture, we have Jesus' mission. He gives it very clearly, very strongly. Verse 10 of this story, it's, he says this, I came to seek and save those who were lost. This is what he was all about. This is why he is walking through Jer Jericho on his way to Jerusalem a week later where he is going to be crucified. This is what it was all about. And Zacchaeus was on his path and he sought him and saved him. So the crowd, they go off in one direction, grumbling and angry and upset. And Jesus and Zacchaeus go arm in arm in the other direction towards Zacchaeus' home. One man who just climbed down from a tree, the other man about to go up on a tree to be crucified. But this was the mission of Jesus, and Zacchaeus mattered. Now, there's a point in the story where Zacchaeus stands up and makes a profound statement, and it's meant to be in contrast with what we just heard from the crowd that was grumbling about Jesus. And Zacchaeus stands up, and it actually is a, a, a formal moment, a very profound moment. And it says, Zacchaeus stood up before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor, Lord and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. 
This is what happens when you encounter Jesus. Your whole perspective changes. Your whole ideology, your mind gets radically changed as a result. You're no longer thinking, I mean, because Zacchaeus, all his life, he was thinking about his, his power, his position, his portfolio. He was thinking about all of these things, but now all of a sudden, that doesn't matter anymore. He's been a self-serving, self-centered individual. But now, it doesn't matter. And so he demonstrates the, 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 the declaration of, of this, the boldness of what's happening inside of him. He says, I'm going to give right off the top half my wealth to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody, which is probably a lot of people, four times as much. An unbelievable interest. Far more than what the law demanded. I'm going to pay them back. The servants of Zacchaeus probably fainted after hearing this. They were astonished that here before them stood a changed man. And, and this, is, uh, this is what Walter Rushenbush said, that right here the camel passed through the, needle of, uh, the needle's eye and Jesus stood and cheered. This is a remarkable moment. Transformation, metamorphosis. And Jesus confirmed this change of heart in the next verse. His salvation has come to this home today. So Zacchaeus might have climbed the tree to take a peek at Jesus, but Jesus sought him out and saved him. One more quick point, and this is very brief, and that is, I must never give up hope. Now, if you were there in those days in Jericho, and somebody asked you, Let's, I'm going to just take a survey here, and I'm going to say, okay, who do you think is the least likely person to have a change of heart? Who's the least likely person to actually move towards God in this city right now? Chances are Zacchaeus would get the greatest amount of votes. He would never, ever experience transformation. And yet, who would have known that day that he would have emerged from his spiritual cocoon as a changed man? There are people in this church who five years ago, maybe even three years ago, who would say to themselves, I would never come to a church. I would never give my heart over to Jesus. And yet God has done a miracle in their life. There's metamorphosis. Is changed life possible? Absolutely. We've just heard two testimonies, one from Grace and from Marwa. They're saying, yeah, God has changed my life. So my question for you is who have you given up hope on? Who are you ready to give up hope for? Maybe it's a spouse or a wayward child, a co-worker, a friend, relative, maybe even yourself. Jesus' love is so powerful. It has a capacity to change your heart to change the person's heart that you might be thinking of right now. Can you imagine that, that this person that you're imagining right now is on Jesus' radar screen, and he's going to make him his full attention, his agenda, because God wants to change their heart, recreate, regenerate, brand new way of thinking. Do you believe that? God is a capacity to change our hearts. Let's pray together. Father, we, I, I want to thank you for this amazing story of transformation that reminds us that there is hope. Reminds us that, that you can actually recreate in all of us real change. I can think back in, in my early life that there were days that I did not understand and I was living in a, in a way far from you, self-centered, self-serving. But you sought me out and you brought me into this saving work of Jesus who died and rose again for my life, that my sins are forgiven and that I now can have this relationship with you. And I know there are many here in this room that can express the same kind of prayer of thanksgiving. But there may be also others of you here this morning that are still checking things out. And so if you're here today 
And, and maybe you've been starting to feel this tugging from God's heart to your heart. And you know this morning that you need what Zacchaeus needed. And so I want to encourage you just to invite Jesus into your life, uh, just as Zacchaeus did. And it's a very simple process, just simply saying, God, I, I need your help. And I'm going to trust you, Jesus, for, for forgiving my sins, for bringing me into this brand new life, this transformation, this metamorphosis from the inside out. And so from this day forward, I'm going to allow you, Jesus, to lead my life. And so, dear Jesus, we, we know it is your desire to change our heart, to remove all of the, the cluttered and the confusing and the, uh, the lack of clear thinking that's happening about, about ourselves. We know that you want to clean that up and help us. And so, Father, I thank you for giving us new life, that you have sought us out, and you came to save uh, those who are lost. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.